Hello and welcome to another supplementary lecture for General Physics 2. This is the final lecture of the electromagnetism unit and deals with the topics of capacitors, inductors, and electrical energy. Since we've already uh, thought about capacitors a couple of times before we first introduced them in the electrostatics unit, we're going to talk about the topic of inductance and inductors first in general and define what we mean by those, and then consider what we what happens when we put both capacitors and inductors separately into a circuit where the current is not uh, steadying in one direction anymore, a direct current circuit, but rather an alternating current circuit. Finally, we're going to uh, give some applications of electrical energy transfer. So what do we mean when we say inductance? Well, let's think about something that by now we should be fairly familiar with. Um, if we have a circuit consisting of a three volt battery and a one ohm resistor and a switch, before we close that switch, the current flowing in that circuit is zero. Uh, and after we close the switch, we can measure the current flowing in that circuit to be three amps. You can work that out with Ohm's law. But uh, that current must have ramped, and it does so quickly, up from zero up to three amps uh, flowing throughout this circuit. Well, now let's think about this in the context of the material we've just worked through, namely Faraday's law. Because here we have a current that goes flowing through the circuit where there wasn't one previously. And that means, of course, that this is going to induce a magnetic field. And you can apply uh, a right-hand rule for predicting the direction of the magnetic field from current that is flowing uh, clockwise around a circuit and deduce that, at least in the center of this loop right here, there would be a, a magnetic field that would be into the page. Well. Uh, there was previously no magnetic field in the center of this circuit. Now there is one, and of course uh, that has the tendency to induce an EMF in the loop. After all, uh, a completed circuit is a loop of conductors, and so as the magnetic field created by the current flow uh, points into the page and is increasing with time, albeit over a brief amount of time, the loop of the circuit itself is going to induce an EMF that opposes that change uh, and essentially tries to create a magnetic field that is out of the page, which is a resistance to that increase in current. The EMF opposes the change, uh, and so there's briefly what is referred to as a back EMF in this circuit. Of course, when we have a single loop in a circuit like this, this effect is almost uh, unnoticeable and it would be very difficult to measure. Uh, and so it turns out that we ignore this induced uh, back EMF in a situation like this. But if we put something into the circuit that we're familiar with, namely a coil that has many, many, many turns of wire, uh, we can actually no longer affect that, uh, ignore rather that effect of that back EMF. So uh, the magnetic flux in this loop is going to be proportional to the amount of current that's flowing. The more current you have, the more uh, magnetic flux you have in the center of that loop. And like we've done many, many other times in physics, when we have a statement of proportionality and we say one thing is proportional to another thing, we can turn that into an equality by introducing some sort of constant. And the constant that we introduce in this case is abbreviated with a capital L and it is referred to as the self-inductance, the self-inductance of this circuit. In other words, uh, its natural tendency to resist the change in current, which is happening as a result of closing this switch. Well, recall from the previous lecture or previous reading uh, that we have Faraday's law, which says uh, the induced EMF is equal to the negative of the change in flux with respect to time. I've left out the N for the number of loops in here because in this particular situation, we're dealing with just a single loop. Well, if you uh, compare and say, okay, flux is inductance times current, you can exchange those for the flux. And because inductance turns out to be a quantity that's depending on the physical parameters of the system, uh, we'll get to that more on the next slide. Uh, that can be treated as a constant and pulled out of the change here. And we're left with a restatement of Faraday's law that says the induced EMF is equal to the negative of the self-inductance of the coil 
times the change in current with respect to time. Those of you that have some calculus, uh, this is seen in other books as the derivative of the current with respect to time. Inductance is measured in units of Henry's. Uh, the abbreviation is a capital H, and if you like doing things in more fundamental units, one Henry is defined to be one volt second per ampere. Uh, and you can in fact work that out from this expression here if you move all the other terms over to the other side. EMF has units of volts, time has units of seconds, and current has units of amperes. Uh, of course, you'll occasionally see this equality rewritten in terms of different factors depending on which equation the inductance is showing up in. If you actually have an inductor in a circuit, uh, given that we ignore the self-inductance of a single loop in a circuit because it is so minuscule, um, the inductor uh, is more likely to be, or, or, or a material that you'll get uh, a higher amount of inductance in will be a coil like we've studied so far. The solenoid coils that we've messed with uh, in the lab uh, previously are examples of things that can be used as inductors. So an inductor is simply a coil of wire, and we have already uh, developed an expression for the magnetic field of a solenoid. Uh, a solenoid magnetic field, recall, is equal to that permeability constant mu zero times the number of turns in the solenoid times the amount of current that you're pushing through the solenoid divided by the length of that solenoid. Uh, this is again something we've previously defined. We've defined magnetic flux to be the magnetic field times the area times the cosine of the angle, and in this case it's the angle between the magnetic field vector and the area vector, which is a vector that's drawn perpendicular to the plane of the loop that we're dealing with. I think in Knight he uses uh, phi perhaps for the angle rather than theta in his expression. So uh, what does this mean? Well, if we're talking about the flux created by a solenoid, we can take the magnetic field term in that expression and replace it with uh, how we calculate the magnetic field from a solenoid and get an expression that says the flux is equal to the permeability constant times the number of turns in the solenoid times the current going through the solenoid divided by the length all times the area, uh, the cross-sectional area of the solenoid. And here I've taken out the cosine theta assuming that we get the area in the magnetic field uh, to be in the same direction. Uh, and I'm just going to rearrange that slightly by switching the place of the current and the cross-sectional area in that expression. Faraday's law, you'll recall, uh, says that the induced EMF is equal to minus the number of turns times the change in flux with respect to time. So now I'm going to dump all this stuff that we just said is the flux in a solenoid into that expression. So I'm just replacing the phi, the flux term in here with all of the things uh, from the previous line. And now let's look at what's in that expression. So this is a change in any of this stuff could change the flux. But if you're dealing with putting a, a solenoid coil into a circuit and having it act as an inductor, uh, well, mu zero is a constant, so that can get pulled out of the change. The number of turns is not likely to change when you are operating a circuit. You have a certain number of windings on your solenoid, and that's the solenoid you're using in a circuit. Similarly, you're not likely to change the area or the length of the solenoid in operation. The only thing that's likely to change, in fact, during an operation of a circuit is the current that's flowing through that. So all the rest of these things can be treated as constants, pulled out of this, and we can rewrite the expression uh, as minus, and I just put the permeability constant out front, mu zero. I have an n in here and an n in here, so I end up with an n squared. I have a cross-sectional area of the solenoid. I have uh, the length of the solenoid times the change in current over the change in time. And because we previously said the EMF is uh, equal to the negative of the inductance times the change in current with respect to time, that must mean that the inductance itself or the self-inductance of a solenoid can be calculated by all of these constants that got pulled out of here, mu zero, n squared, cross-sectional area, uh, divided by the length. All right, what happens when you put a solenoid into a circuit? Well, first let's consider a circuit 
similar to the one that we looked at in lab where we hook a solenoid uh, in series to a resistor and we put that into a DC circuit so there's only going to be one direction of current flow in this circuit. Well, if we apply Kirchhoff's loop rule to this circuit, assuming when the switch is closed and start down here, we would increase the voltage by whatever the voltage of the battery is, decrease the voltage by whatever the voltage uh, across the resistor is, and that, according to Ohm's law, is the current through the resistor times the value of the resistance, and then minus whatever the voltage is across the inductor. Well, the voltage across the inductor is equal to the inductance times the change in current with respect to time, as we showed on previous slides. Then we're back to where we started, so Kirchhoff's loop rule says that has to sum up uh, to equal zero. So this is not going to be obvious to most of us in this class, but um, to some of you that have had some calculus and maybe even some differential equations, this is actually a differential equation. Uh, and that's beyond the mathematical scope of this course to solve that. But if you change this delta i over delta t to a derivative, you have an expression that says the derivative of a function has to return the original function times some constants. And if you've ever played around with differential equations, you might recognize the form of that. For the rest of us, we're just going to take the solution as given to us by uh, whichever physicist first figured this out. And the current with respect to time ends up being equal to the potential difference of the battery divided by the resistance of the resistor times 1 minus e to the minus t over some constants. And uh, you saw this expression in the lab experiment that we did. It's not obvious what those constants are necessarily, but they end up being uh, the inductance divided by the resistance. And so this expression and the form of this expression is uh, reminiscent of the charging equation for a capacitor. Though recall that in a capacitor we had resistance times capacitance in the denominator. Here we have inductance divided by resistance, uh, so it's slightly different. But if you think about the, the, the nature of this mathematical function, when t gets really big, e to the minus really big number is approximately zero, and so the current should reach some maximum value at some uh, amount of time. And very often, if you see this expression, uh, the potential difference across the battery divided by the resistance is the current that's flowing through that resistor, but because this reaches a maximum after some amount of time, we often call that a steady state current. There's a, a constant amount of current that you achieve uh, after some time when an inductor has been operating in the circuit. Um, again, depending on where you look, sometimes L over R is replaced by tau, a time constant. Uh, again, similar to what we did in the circuit capacitor uh, circuits when we replaced RC with a tau for the time constant there. Uh, and so the current here as a function of time increases and uh, as you saw in lab, in many situations, increases very, very, very rapidly. But you have current that's increasing uh, and after one time constant has about two thirds of the value of the maximum current. And after five or six times constants essentially has reached that steady state current um, that we get. And another way you can think about this situation is when I close this switch, I start sending a current through the circuit. That current, of course, goes through this inductor. Well, the current going through the inductor creates a magnetic field in the center of that inductor. Um, and that, of course, induces a back EMF, an EMF within the inductor that tries to oppose the change that caused it in the first place. So that inductor essentially fights against the increasing current through it. But at some point, when the current in the circuit has reached a maximum, uh, and the current is no longer changing as it passes through the inductor, that inductor no longer induces any EMF. And this circuit now behaves just like a, a simple circuit with one battery and one resistor, and the inductor essentially is just acting like a conducting wire now. The uh, loops and magnets and such that we played around with uh, a couple of lab experiments ago um, give us the basic... Uh, tools needed to understand how two devices uh, operate, and those are generators and motors. Uh, 
A generator is a device that's used to convert mechanical energy into electrical energy. And of course, you might be familiar with the fact that if there's ever an emergency and you lose power, some people uh, have generators to supply them with uh, emergency power in situations like that. Well, in that situation, you are running some sort of gasoline motor uh, and moving things and then converting that mechanical energy into electrical energy that you can use to power the electrical devices in your house. So I have a loop at the root of a generator and I am turning uh, that loop in the uh, presence of a magnetic field. Well, as I turn that loop, that changes the amount of magnetic flux that passes through that loop. When I change the amount of flux that passes through that loop, whoops, um, then I induce an EMF. And when I induce an EMF, uh, I can use that essentially as a power source to send current uh, through a circuit. Well, if you are keeping on twisting this thing around, um, you will induce, you'll, you'll start perhaps at zero and go up to a, a maximum EMF in one direction. Uh, but then as the loop continues to turn, the induced EMF will decrease until you're back at zero. And then as the loop is essentially 180 degrees from the orientation it started at, you're going to induce an EMF uh, again, but this time it's going to be in the opposite direction. And so when we uh, run a generator like this, the current that we get out of there uh, is an alternating current because the EMF that we're creating keeps on switching from positive to negative to positive to negative to positive to negative. And you may be familiar with the fact that our household wiring is run on alternating current circuits. And so this is a situation where um, the voltages are reversing uh, periodically 60 times a second, at least in U.S. households. And that means the current is switching direction back and forth 60 times a second. Light bulbs don't care what direction the current goes through them. And in fact, the current is, you know, turning on and off and on and off and on and off rapidly enough that we don't see the filament stop to glow when we have a light bulb plugged into uh, a standard outlet. A motor is a reverse of a generator. And in fact, you can at least crudely use one device, just depending on whether you're feeding electricity into it or mechanical energy into it uh, to do one or the other. And so in a motor, I'm taking electrical energy and I'm sending an electrical current through this loop. That is going to create a magnetic field in this loop. And uh, that current that's flowing through will also cause the loop uh, to feel forces on the sides of the loop. And we've worked through this concept in the workbook exercises. That exerts a torque on the loop and that turns the loop. And so uh, with some clever engineering, including some metal slip rings so that the current can switch directions periodically, I can get a loop to continuously turn uh, in a magnetic field. If I hook that to some sort of shaft, I can then drive some sort of mechanical device where I started with electrical energy uh, feeding into the system, and now I use this system to convert it to mechanical energy. Well, uh, both of these, here the electrical input was an alternating current, um, and on the previous slide, the output of that generator was also an alternating current, brings us to talking a little bit about alternating current circuits. Again, in an alternating current circuit, the um, polarity, if you will, of uh, the, the two sides of the circuit is periodically switching uh, 60 times a second in our um, electrical grid setups. And when you draw a circuit diagram with an alternating current source, it's drawn with a circle and this little squiggly, I don't know, sine wave in there, if you will. So let's now think about what happens when we put capacitors and inductors into these alternating current circuits. Uh, the book briefly touches on what happens when we put resistors in these alternating current circuits, um, but you can just work that out with a simple application of Ohm's law. You send an alternating current through a resistor um, and it just has alternating current. One time the current's going one direction, a little bit later the current's going the opposite direction. Uh, that's true about capacitors and inductors to some degree, but they have some interesting properties when you put them into an alternating current circuit that we should talk about. So here's what I'm assuming. I'm assuming that this source has some sort of EMF, and this EMF is equal to some 
maximum amount of EMF that I get out of the system, but then it's varying periodically. So I'm going to use a cosine function to describe how that's varying periodically because a cosine function, of course, if you plot it, goes from maximum to zero to minimum to zero to maximum to zero or positive, negative, positive, negative, however you want to think about that. How quickly it changes depends on something called the frequency, how many cycles per second. If you've studied that concept in physics one, uh, great. If you haven't, we will touch on it more when we get into our waves and optics unit next. Um, times the time. So in here, if I take the frequency, the number of cycles per second, multiply it by a time, and then multiply it by two pi, it ends up turning this into an angle that's measured in radians. I take the cosine of that and I uh, figure out what the EMF is at any instant in time. But the important thing in our discussion right now is simply that the EMF is oscillating between positive and negative. Well, that means of course that uh, the current is going one direction first and then the other direction. And so when I have a capacitor here, uh, the one one plate is getting charged positively while the other plate is being charged negatively and then a little while later that's reversed and the uh, the formerly negative plate will become charged positively and the formerly positive plate will become charged negatively it's not uncommon to see uh, on these diagrams that they label a capacitor current i sub c in this particular diagram that does not mean that there's a current actually flowing through the capacitor. Recall from our previous studies that if this were to happen, your capacitor would be broken and wouldn't be functioning as a capacitor in the circuit. But rather what they mean by that is however much, uh, let's say, uh, current is, is going into this top plate uh, to make it charge positively. Again, the conventional current is in the direction of positive flow. That same amount of current would be being pulled off of the bottom plate to make it equally negatively charged. So if I measured current right before the capacitor and right after the capacitor, they would be the same amount. So we often just refer to that as the current uh, at the capacitor or through the capacitor, even though no charges are actually jumping across that gap. Similarly, as we charge the capacitor, you know, one plate's positive, one plate's negative. A little bit later, it switches one, the other plate's negative and the first plate's positive. Uh, so there's a potential difference across that capacitor, like we had when we studied capacitors in DC circuits. It just happens to be changing sign periodically, and it does so to match the battery. So the potential difference at some instant in time is equal to the maximum potential difference times that same cosine function, which describes the oscillation uh, of the power supply. Well, we still have our expressions that we can carry forward from studying capacitance. So the charge on the capacitor is still equal to the capacitance uh, times the potential difference. Recall that's just from the definition of capacitance as charge per potential difference. Uh, the current that is flowing through the capacitor can be deduced if we think about how the charge on the capacitor is changing with time. This is just our definition of current from the beginning of our circuits work. Uh, and that means then that since charge is capacitance times potential difference, I can substitute that into the delta expression. Capacitance is going to be constant if I don't change the actual physical capacitor in my circuit. So I can pull that out of the changing expression and have this expression that says the current that flows through, and I'm air quoting here, even though you can't see that, uh, the capacitor is equal to the size of the capacitor times the change in the electric potential measured across the capacitor as a function of time. So those are those same expressions just written here, but let's take a look at the graphs uh, from the textbook and see if we can make sense of what these are trying to tell us. So again, if I have an AC circuit the voltage being produced by the power supply is oscillating. It's changing periodically from being positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. That means the voltage measured across the capacitor is going to be doing the same thing. It might start out positive. A little while later, it's zero when the capacitor is uncharged. Then the capacitor charges in the opposite direction. So the voltage goes to some maximum negative. Uh, then it goes back to zero, maximum positive, and keeps repeating this you know, endlessly as long as the circuit remains hooked up. What does that mean about the charge that's stored on the capacitor? Well, the charge that's stored on the capacitor 
is um, going to match the voltage of the capacitor from this expression, right? Capacitance is a constant. So whenever voltage is positive, charge is positive. Whenever voltage is negative, charge is negative. So the charge oscillates from maximum positive charge to zero to maximum negative charge to zero to maximum positive charge. But the current is related to how to the change in charge over time. So how is the charge changing? Well, when you just start here, if you have the maximum amount of charge, for this instant, the charge isn't changing at all. The slope on this graph is zero, so the current is zero. But then as the charge decreases, that means the current that's flowing uh, through, or more correctly, on both sides of the capacitor, also decreases and it's some negative value. It reaches the maximum negative value when the charge is changing the most rapidly, which is as the capacitor is uh, passing through its uncharged state. Then uh, the, the process slows down a little bit as the uh, sign of the charges on the plates is switched and the plate that was positive is becoming more and more and more and more negative and vice versa. Again, when I reach maximum negative charge, the current is back to zero because the charge at this instant is not changing. Uh, and then as the charge increases or gets less and less and less and less negative, the current is increasing. It reaches a peak when the charge is changing the most rapidly and the cycle repeats. So the current doesn't follow uh, the voltage in this particular situation. In fact, um, the current is said to lead the voltage because the, if you look at this graph, the current reaches its maximum negative value at a quarter of the time, whatever the time happens to be. The voltage reaches its maximum negative value at half the time. So the current peaks happen before the voltage peaks and the current is said to uh, lead the voltage or the voltage lags the current, however you want to think about that. So uh, the capacitance current, again, is the capacitance times the change in voltage with respect to time. Um, some of the things in the book ask you for uh, working out details of knowing the maximum amount of current, namely, what is the maximum amount of current that goes through here? Well, to know the maximum amount of current, you really have to know the maximum value of the change in the voltage across the capacitor. And the book puts forth an argument for how you can reason this based on what you know about simple harmonic motion from physics one. Um, so clearly if you remember that from physics one and that those parallels make sense to you, great. Um, I personally think uh, it's not very easy to do because technically to know when this peaks, you need to know some calculus. You need to take the expression for the voltage across the capacitor and take its derivative and what that does is it kicks out uh, a 2 pi times the frequency uh, out in front of this. If you've not had any calculus and that uh, argument doesn't make any sense to you, uh, you can just accept on face value that the, the change in voltage with respect to time peaks at 2 times pi times the frequency um, times whatever the maximum voltage across the capacitor is. So if the maximum voltage across the capacitor uh, is 10 volts, um, then you can uh, multiply that by the frequency, multiply that by 2 pi, and that gives you the maximum uh, change in voltage with respect to time. You multiply that by the capacitance and you get the maximum uh, current that's flowing through the capacitor. What that does tell you, of course, is that uh, if, it, uh, if you increase the frequency, um, then the maximum current will also increase. All right, I don't know why in the book uh, they switched from the lowercase i to the uppercase i, but I was trying to match uh, Knight's notation here. The current that's flowing on either side of the capacitor is equal to this uh, capacitance, uh, actually the maximum current, so perhaps that's why we switched to the capital I here. It's equal to the capacitance times the maximum value or the peak value of this delta V with respect to T, um, which is 2 pi times the frequency times the maximum voltage. Uh, 
just rearranging slightly and pulling the capacitance into the parentheses and pulling the voltage out. And the reason I'm doing this is to, we got current, we got voltage, and then we got everything else. And that probably brings to mind another relationship where we have voltage and current related to one another, namely Ohm's law. So in fact, let's make that look a little bit more like Ohm's law. If we isolate voltage, we would say that maximum voltage across the capacitor is equal to the maximum current through the capacitor or on either side of the capacitor uh, divided by 2 pi times the frequency times the capacitance. Well, that whole stuff in the denominator here gets uh, renamed a capital X for the reactance of the capacitor times the current of the capacitor. So capacitive reactance uh, is defined to be 1 over 2 pi times the frequency um, times the capacitance. Well, capacitive reactance is not the exact same thing as resistance, but it does tell you how much the capacitor reacts to what the changes are that are happening in the circuit. And what we should notice out of this is when the frequency is big, the reactance of the capacitor um, is small. And I guess the way that I think about this is if I'm switching the polarity of positive and negative really, really, really fast, I'm not giving the capacitor full time to charge and discharge like I would if I'm changing positive to negative, positive to negative much more slowly. And so, um, the capacitor will impede flow, if you will, in the circuit much more when the frequency is small and much less when the frequency is large. Uh, in fact, if you make the frequency really big, um, you can essentially ignore uh, the effects of the capacitor in that circuit. We talked a little bit about inductors. So what happens when you put an inductor in the same alternating circuit, alternating current circuit rather? Okay, so I still have the same EMF that I'm driving the power supply at, uh, and that will cause a potential difference across the inductor. If they're the only two things in the loop, the potential difference across the inductor has to equal the potential difference across the power supply. So we can say the potential difference across the inductor is equal to some maximum value times that same cosine function, which helps us describe the time change that's happening in terms of the uh, polarity of the voltage or the direction of the current or however you would like to think about that. Similarly, uh, if there's a potential difference across that inductor, uh, a current is being sent through that inductor and so we're going to label that as I sub L. And so if you plot the um, voltage across an inductor and the current across an inductor, um, then it looks something like this. Uh, so the current is oscillating, and so we just drew it as a sine curve here. It starts out at zero, goes up to some maximum value, goes back to zero, goes to some minimum value, goes back to zero, and, and et cetera. Well, the uh, voltage across the inductor, uh, recall from our definition of inductor slides a few minutes ago, uh, is equal to the EMF. Uh, and the induced EMF, at least magnitude-wise, is equal to the inductance times how rapidly the current through that uh, inductor, a typo here, sorry about that, this should be an L, but that current through the inductor is changing with respect to time. So uh, here the current is changing a lot in the positive direction, so I get a maximum positive voltage. And the slope of this i.e. the change of current gets less and less and less and less and less until I reach a point where the current is no longer changing for a moment. At that point, the voltage across the inductor goes to zero. Then the current starts to decrease and uh, change in a negative fashion, so the voltage goes negative. At some point, I have maximum change when the slope on my current graph is maximum. And that's when I'm getting maximum negative voltage. When I reach the uh, peak negative value of the current, I'm back to having no change in the current and the voltage goes back to zero. So again, the voltage and the current are out of phase with one another. But here, uh, the current peaks happen after the voltage peaks. And so the current is said to lag the voltage, whereas in a capacitor circuit, the current leads the voltage. So 
Same typo carried forward because I cut and paste again. This C should be an L for the current through the inductor. Um, but the voltage across the inductor is equal to the inductance times the change in the inductor current with uh, respect to time or over the change in time. And it's a similar argument here. When is this thing going to be a maximum? Well, the change in current is going to be a maximum uh, when, um, or rather has a maximum value when uh, it's the current through the inductor times two pi times the frequency. Again, the book presents one explanation for how you can think about that, but for my money, you can't really understand where this expression comes from until you've taken some calculus and realize that the derivative of the current function uh, can be used to find the maximum value of that function. So, like we did before, uh, I'm going to pull the inductor into the parentheses and pop the uh, current out of the parentheses to rewrite the expression in this fashion. And that again is to get this in the form of an Ohm's law-like equation and to say that the stuff in parentheses can be replaced by uh, an X and the X is the reactance of the inductor. So we have inductive uh, reactants, just like we had capacitive reactants uh, a couple of slides ago. And that inductive reactance, how much the uh, inductor reacts to changes that are happening in the circuit is directly proportional to the frequency. If you bump up the frequency in a circuit that has an inductor in it, um, the higher the frequency, the more essentially resistance you have from that inductor. Well, think about that in the context of what we've done with Faraday's law previously. If I bump up the frequency, that means I'm changing from positive to negative, positive to negative, positive to negative, more rapidly than I was before. Doing that switches the direction of the current in the inductor more rapidly, and that induces a larger EMF to try to oppose that change. So there's a bigger fight against the changes that are happening in the circuit when the frequency is high. I'm not going to uh, go into this story, but I'll just point out that um, alternating current circuits, as we've just been talking about for the last few minutes, um, are the predominant method of electrical energy transmission in the United States. But this was not always so. After people had worked out the theories of electricity and how things should work, uh, it turns out, probably unsurprisingly, that the U.S., the places at least in the U.S. that were becoming powered, uh, were a hodgepodge of direct current circuits like we've studied more in this class and alternating current circuits. And uh, this is often framed as a war between Edison, who was favoring direct current circuits, and uh, Nikolai Tesla, who was favoring alternating current circuits and was financed by uh, George Westinghouse in his ideas for developing. If you realize that we have alternating current today, uh, you realize that, uh, of course, Westinghouse and Tesla eventually won, but DC did not go away super quickly. Uh, in fact, I think it was 2006 when the uh, last hotel in New York City that had been wired with direct current electricity uh, switched over to alternating current. So clearly, uh, that was a holdover from a bygone era, but it, it actually has happened within all of our lifetimes. And if you are interested, uh, read the Current Wars page on Wikipedia or perhaps a better historical account of it. It's a really fascinating story about uh, the fight, I guess, for technological supremacy. But AC won out. Why did AC win out? Well, uh, AC won out because of your the power company's ability to... Um, get energy from point A to point B much more easily in an alternating current system they can, than they can with a direct current system. If Edison had won, you would likely be living within a mile of a power plant. All of us would be, and, and uh, electrifying rural parts of America like much of Iowa would be a very difficult challenge. So the power company has this problem because they, of course, don't want to build an infinite number of power plants, but the more wire they have to run between the power plant and your house, the greater, of course, the resistance there is in that wire to the current flow. Even though we've been treating wires as ideal conductors, they're not. There's some resistance. Uh, 
And the more resistance you have, the more energy you lose essentially to heat that you can't deliver as electricity to the customer's house. Now, cynically, I want to say, even if this was happening, the power company is still charging you for it, but they would like to get as much electrical energy from point A to point B as possible without losing it all uh, as heat along the way. Well, recall previously we defined electrical power to be the product of voltage and current, and we rewrote that as voltage squared divided by resistance or current squared times resistance, all using Ohm's law. Well, it's this last expression that uh, sheds some light on what's going on here. When I have uh, a high current, uh, I get um, a high power loss. And if I have some way of knocking that current down, um, then I will get uh, less energy loss because the current uh, is directly proportional to the amount of heat that you're going to get in the wire and how much energy loss you're going to get there. So you can deliver the same amount of energy per time, the same amount of power, if you look at the original expression for power here, if you have high voltage and low current, or if you have low voltage and high current. And of course, if you want to reduce your loss, you want to go with high voltage, low current. And so you are probably familiar with the fact that you know all across our cities, there are high voltage power lines transferring energy from the electrical, you know, generating plants to the end user of that electricity. Um, but uh, given that we have a very large reservoir of charge that we're connected to there, it would be dangerous, of course, to run wires that have 500,000 volts down to your house. In your house, there's 120 volts and 240 volts, and that's about it. So how does the power company transmit it at high voltage, but then get it to lower voltage to deliver to you? Well, they use a device called a transformer, not the kind up here on the left, but rather the kind up here on the right, uh, at least shown in part of this picture that can change low voltage to high voltage or high voltage to low voltage. How does a transformer work? Well, if you've ever ripped apart a power adapter like this one. Actually, I guess this is just a charger, not necessarily an adapter. You may have seen something inside that looks like this. It looks like two coils of wire. And if you look closely, you'll notice that these two coils of wire do not have the same number of turns. This wire is a bigger diameter wire. This one's a smaller. So this has many, many more turns than this one does. And that actually allows us to step up or step down the voltage in this arrangement depending on uh, which way you're sending power into this device. So a theoretical picture of a transformer looks something like this. I have some sort of iron core. Iron is a good transmitter of a magnetic field. So I'm going to use something like an iron core. I'm going to wind some wires around one side and then I'm going to wind some wires around on the other side but I'm not going to have the same number of windings on both sides of that transformer. So what do I do? Well, I send a current in on the primary side here, and that passes through a loop in this wire, uh, and that creates a EMF. Uh, and the EMF in a single turn gets multiplied by the number of turns I have on that side, and we can say that is the EMF on side one. So whatever voltage I hook this to, that's the EMF on side one, but dividing that by the number of turns would tell you essentially the EMF in each turn. That EMF uh, creates a magnetic flux. Again, if I have some good magnetic conductor like an iron core, that magnetic flux will be passed around to the other side of this iron core where that flux passes through loops on the other side. And if that flux is changing, then that will induce a current in the windings on the other side and create a secondary current over here, even though the wires that are doing this aren't directly connected to one another. If we assume perfect, which is of course our, our favorite thing to do in these uh, theoretical physics texts, we would say, okay, well over on, on side two, uh, the EMF through a single turn here is the same as the EMF through a turn over here. If I didn't get any loss in the transmission there. Um, but the total EMF on side two is then that EMF in a single turn times the number of turns I have over on my secondary side. So if the EMF 
the E and F in a single turn are the same on both sides, then I can rearrange things to write this ratio that the EMF on side two uh, over the number of turns on side two is equal to the EMF on side one over the number of turns on side one. EMF, of course, is our uh, fancy way of saying, you know, the maximum potential difference. So more commonly, we end up just writing this as the potential difference on side two over the number of turns on side two is equal to the potential difference on side one over the number of turns on side one. Uh, again, if we're assuming there's no energy loss in this, which of course is not true if you've ever felt one of these power adapters, they're warm, they're always losing heat, but we're going to assume for the sake of this argument that the power we get out of one of these is the power that we put into one of them. Uh, that would say that the current on side one times the potential difference on side one is equal to the current on side two times the potential difference on side two. If I uh, replace uh, the, well, rather, if I solve for I2 by moving potential difference on side two over to this side, so that's what I've done here in step one, the ratio of the potential difference on side one to the potential difference on side two can be replaced by the ratio of the number of turns on side one to the number of turns on side two from rearranging this expression over here. And then I can get an expression which relates the currents on both sides to the number of turns on both sides. So what do these two expressions tell us? Well, if, like I have in this picture, N2, which would be the secondary side, is smaller than N1, then whatever potential difference I fed in on side one is gonna be reduced to a lower potential difference on side two, because there are fewer turns over here. But, uh, on side two, if N2 is fewer than N1, uh, then the current on side two is actually going to be more than the current on side one. So let's solve a couple of transformer problems to try to illustrate how one would use these ratios. So uh, in this, um, neon lights, which you may be familiar with, are an example of light produced as a result of an electrical discharge in a tube filled with a gas, which emits a characteristic color. The light emitted by the discharge tubes is important in the study of atomic physics. And by the way, if anybody wants to see one of these tubes, uh, we have a handful of them for various experiments that we unfortunately won't get to in the, in the course of this class. Uh, to produce the electrical discharge, a high voltage must be applied to electrodes sealed at the ends of the tube. So basically, you're just sending a current through this gas, and if you energize it enough, the gas will glow. The resistance of the tube is 1.52 times 10 to the 6 ohms, and the RMS current through it is 3 milliamps. For the sake of this, uh, RMS means root mean square, and it's talked about in the textbook, though I did not address it directly in this lecture. It is the topic of one of the workbook exercises that we will look at, class, uh, at in class, however. So the RMS current through it is 3 milliamps. It's a way of averaging the current when the current is always changing from positive to negative, positive to negative, positive to negative. The transformer that's used to produce the high voltage is plugged into a standard electrical outlet. Find the number of turns of, uh, or the ratio rather, of the number of turns in the secondary side of this arrangement to the number of turns in the primary side. All right. So what do we do with that? I've taken the text from that problem and reproduced it here on a uh, less dark slide. So for an ideal transformer, we previously showed on the theory slide that the potential difference on one side uh, to the number of turns on that same side, that ratio is the same as the ratio of the potential difference on the other side to the number of turns on the second side. So that means if I get all the n's on one side and all the b's on the other, that the ratio of turns on side two to side one is equal to the potential difference on side two to side one. So uh, for a standard electrical outlet, if you've read in the book or done any wiring in the past, you may know uh, that's got to be between 110 and 120 volts in U.S. circuits. Um, and Ohm's law can be applied here as well because we know that the potential difference is equal to the current times the resistance. So again, this is the ratio N2 over N1 is delta V2 over delta V1, but the potential difference on side two is the amount of current we have on side two uh, times the resistance on side two, side two being the output of this tube where we have this high resistance. So 
The current going through the neon tube is the 300 milliamps. That's 3 times 10 to the minus 3 amps. Resistance is 1.5 times 10 to the 6 ohms. The potential difference of an outlet I'm assuming to be 120 volts. And so out of that ratio, we get 38. So what does that mean? You would need a ratio of 38 turns to one turn uh, in order to produce this high voltage necessary to light this neon light. So the side that's connected to your 120 volt wall outlet, for each turn on that side, you need 38 times as many turns on the side that's going to be connected to the neon discharge tube. Another example of this, here's a, a full-on AC adapter, uh, and we're going to talk about its function in just a minute internally, but it uses a transformer, several diodes, and a capacitor to convert a high alternating current voltage into a low direct current voltage. And as more and more of our lives are powered by battery devices, laptops, cell phones, and the like, these things are again a bigger and bigger part of our lives as we have to power our devices in between times of using them. So uh, if you look at it, this, it has a bunch of specs about this. So somebody made this, it's a certain model, but you would put in a 120 volt alternating current signal in here at a frequency of 60 hertz and uh, 200 milliamps of current. And that power adapter would convert this to 12 volts direct current uh, and 400 milliamps of current. Um, so what percentage of the electrical energy input becomes electrical energy output? And what is the ratio of turns in the transformer internal to this adapter? Well, let's take on the ratio question first. The voltage on the primary side would be 120 volts, the voltage of the wall outlet. And the primary side has 200 milliamps of current. Uh, we have 12 volts coming out with 400 uh, milliamps of, of current. So the ratio of turns, the number of turns on the secondary side to the number of turns on the primary side is equal to the potential difference on the secondary side over the potential difference on the primary side. And if I plug in those numbers, it's 12 volts over 120 volts, and the ratio is 1 to 10. So it's 1 to 10 or 10 to 1, depending on which way you're writing the ratio. This problem doesn't really specify uh, which way that goes. How much, uh, what percentage of the electrical energy input becomes electrical energy output? Well, to do that, we have to use both the current and the voltage uh, numbers off of this. So the energy out divided by the energy in is going to be the same ratio as the power out over the power in, because power, again, is energy per time, and we're comparing output and input over the same length of time. Electrical power is the product of voltage and current, so the output voltage, the output current, over the input voltage and the input current. And if you plug in 12 volts out, 400 milliamps out, 120 volts in, 200 milliamps in, uh, you get a ratio, a ratio, you get a value of 0.2, uh, which is 20%. And uh, I don't know if that's surprising to you or not. These adapters do get warm, but the bulk of their energy actually goes into producing heat to warm up your room and only some fraction, something less than 50%, is going to go into actually electrical energy that is fed into the device that you are trying to power or charge. All right, so how do these things work internally? Well, I'm not going to talk about this puzzle a, a great deal other than to say if you like puzzles, this is kind of a fun one. This is a street puzzle. Here's the start and here's the finish. And the rules of the street are this. Whenever you go into an intersection, you can only follow arrows. So in this one, I can go straight through because I have an arrowhead pointing to the right. And I can also curve up and go in this direction because I have that curved line meeting another arrowhead here. But I can't do any sharp turns, so I can't go in here and then turn and go down. This is an illegal turn here. So at this first intersection, I can only go straight through or up. If I go up, I can go over, and then if I hit here, I have to go down because there's no line connecting straight across. If I instead went straight to the right when I went to that first intersection, I get into intersection number two. I can no longer go up because there's no arrowhead there, but I can go down or to the right. And so the challenge is, can you navigate your way through this puzzle and get to the finish uh, street, starting at the start street, following all the posted signs? Well, 
Uh, again, that's an exercise for anybody that's curious, bored, or, or wants to do something like that. But what it's meant to illustrate is that networks can be accessed different ways when there are combinations of one-way streets, if you will, uh, for things to pass through. And so this is the internal guts of an electrical power adapter. We've spent some time talking about this piece of the power adapter, which is the transformer. It takes the 120 volts in or what have you, turns it into 12 volts out or again, whatever voltage output you want to have. But there's also uh, this within a power adapter, a network of four diodes. And this, which you may recognize, we've seen this before as a capacitor. So why do we have all of those things in uh, the power adapter? Well, here's a schematic of a power adapter. I have some sort of alternating current supply over here. It's feeding into the transformer. So this is the symbol for our transformer, which is changing 120 volts AC in this particular diagram down into nine volts AC. Here's my diode network. And what a diode is, uh, simplistically, is a device that only allows current to pass one direction through it. So it's like a one-way street in a network of streets. The current can go in the direction of the arrow, but cannot go back in the other direction. I have a capacitor over here as well, and then I've plugged this into, I guess, the radio that is my device I'm trying to power with this AC adapter. So what happens here? Well, um, when I send alternating current through here, I'm sending current in one direction through this coil. That's inducing a current in a certain direction in this other coil. Let's say it's such a direction that it's sending current into the rest of the circuit uh, to the right up here. Well, the current that goes to the right up here reaches this junction and tries to split. And so it could either go through diode one or diode three. Whoop, can't go through diode three because that one-way street is in the wrong direction, but it can go through diode one. So current will go up here. Again, here's a junction where it could split and it could either go through diode two Oh, can't go through diode two because it's the wrong one-way street. So I guess all the current has to go up at this junction and to the right, which is another junction. And here it can split. There's no diodes in here. So part of that current is going to feed down to the capacitor and start charging up the capacitor. And part of that current is going to feed into the device you're trying to power with this adapter. The stuff that you're sending into the device, you know, passes through the device. There's current flowing through the device, but the current heads back towards uh, the starting place. Similarly, the current heads back from the other side of the capacitor, and those two currents match each other. Those currents combine here at the junction and form a current that's going across uh, this wire and reaching this junction point. At this junction point, the current can either flow through diode 3 uh, or through diode four, but flowing through diode three would take it back to a higher value of electrical potential. So it ends up going through diode four. And again, similarly, if it went through diode two, that would take it to a higher value of electric potential and the current's trying to flow to lower values of electric potential. So the current is gonna complete the path, go over this bridge and back to the starting place. So this is the direction of current flow uh, in one instant. Well, we have an alternating current power supply, so an instant later, the current has switched direction everywhere in this circuit. What's going on there? Well, now the current back here has switched direction, so let's track the current that's going down here. It goes across the bottom here, up here, and reaches this junction, and has to go through diode 2 because diode 4 is a wrong way. It passes through diode 2. And you'll note we're back here at this junction that we were at before after passing through diode one with the current going in the other direction. So current comes over here, part of it goes to the capacitor, part of it goes to the radio. Uh, the capacitor current continues on, the radio current continues on, they come together and they reach this junction again. But here they have to pass through diode three rather than diode four because diode three is the path to a place of lower electrical potential in this particular arrangement. So the transformer in here changes high voltage to low voltage most commonly, though it could change low voltage to high voltage as in that neon tube example. The diode network takes current that's switching direction over in this part of the circuit and makes sure it's always going the same direction in this part of the circuit. The function of the capacitor is when there's a lot of current flowing in here, that excess charge builds up on the capacitor. But because this is alternating current, a little while later, that current is gonna drop off to nothing for a moment. 
And when it does so, that capacitor actually discharges into the radio to maintain a constant current flow through the radio. So you have a transformer changing the voltage, the diode network funneling two-way current into one-way current, and the capacitor charging and discharging to maintain a relatively constant current flow through the device you're powering with your adapter. I'm going to wrap this up by just a couple of minutes of mention of some topics of electrical safety after all. What use is it to study electricity in a physics class if you don't learn anything that could save your life or somebody else's or at least uh, keep you from giving yourself a massive shock? So what devices do we have that create electrical safety? Well, uh, one of the things is that third prong in your grounded outlets. What in the world is that third prong for? And do I need it? And can't I just plug it into an adapter that has two and uh, plug that into my old outlet in my old house? Well, you can, and of course we've all done that, but it is not the safest thing. Why is it not safe? Well, let's say I have an alternating current supply uh, and so that means it's feeding current in through my wall receptacle and then I'm going to plug something in there like my dryer, for example. Well, if I just have a two-prong plug plugged in and I put that in there, uh, the current is going one way through the heater. A little while later, it's going the opposite way through the heater because this is alternating current. But again, the heater is like a bulb filament. As long as it has current passing through it, it's going to be glowing hot. So it doesn't matter what direction that current is going through. Uh, but that current returns back in here and then one part of this circuit is hooked to ground which just means I've hooked it to a big reservoir of charge literally in a house it's supposed to be the ground and the electrician wiring your house is supposed to drive a conductor into the ground outside of the house for excess charge to be dumped into should you need such a thing well why would you need such a thing well let's imagine that the dryer is old or something happens and one of these wires becomes uh, disconnected in the dryer. Well, in that case, charge will build up in the dryer and try to seek a path back to the zero point or back to ground. It can't go into this wire where it was broken, but it can go into the casing of the dryer. And if you uh, are a balding middle-aged person and touch the dryer, that current will flow through you down into the ground and possibly uh, be detrimental to your health. How do you stop that from happening? Well, you can stop that from happening if you have a device that uses a grounded plug, because in a grounded plug, literally that third plug is connected, that third prong of the plug rather, is connected somewhere on the casing of that device. So in the event that the actual circuit that we want to work that contains the heater breaks, any excess charge that's dumped into the casing on that dryer is going to be dumped back through the conducting wire into the ground and back to ground and not through you because again that charge is trying to choose the path of least resistance and through a conducting wire is less resistance than through you. Electricity, uh, you know, we've been dealing with currents of tenths of amps, amps and the like, uh, but when you get up to the amp scale it can actually be detrimental to your health. Um, if you have current passing through you that's as small as a milliamp, uh, some well, many of us can feel that. I think people that have been working with electricity a long time might have lost some sensitivity and no longer feel that. When you get up to a hundredth to two hundredths of an amp, that's when you start to get muscle spasms from the electricity passing through you. Your heart can start to beat erratically uh, with as much as, or as little rather, as two tenths of an amp. And if you have uh, one amp or so of current that passes through your heart, for any length of time, that can be sufficient to stop your heart and ultimately kill you. So you don't need a ton of current. Uh, luckily, your body has a fairly good deal of resistance. And so if, unless you touch something that can send a relatively high current through you, uh, most of us uh, are safe in our dealings with electricity. Um, so a few ideas in sum. Um, often you'll hear people say, oh, high voltage, dang well, Power companies say that, right? Danger, high voltage. There are these signs all over these transmission places. And those are legitimate signs. I don't want to say ignore those signs that power companies and the like post. But high voltage is not in and of itself a dangerous thing. I don't know if you've ever seen a Van de Graaff generator, but they have these devices. We have one in the department where uh, you're piling up charge uh, on the top of the Van de Graaff generator and 
Um, if you have a person touching it that's also electrically isolated, the charge builds up on them. The charges on hairs repel each other, so you get your hair to stand on end. It's a lot of fun. Everybody enjoys playing with those, but they routinely actually build up a potential difference relative to the ground of 50,000 volts, 100,000 volts, 200,000 volts, depending on the Vanegraaff generator. That's not inherently dangerous because they can't store a lot of charge. And high voltage just means that the charges that they are storing have a lot of energy. Um, but they don't store enough charges to form a high current to do anybody any sustained damage as long as there's only one person touching the Van de Graaff generator and it's isolated from uh, other persons or other devices that could store more charge. Current, again, can kill you. So here's a grisly picture from somewhere on the internet of somebody that probably didn't make it and was electrocuted. Uh, current causes your muscles to contract and that actually increases the risk of electrocution. So I'm trying hard to imagine a context in which you would need to touch a wire where you didn't know whether or not current was flowing through it. But I do have a horror story uh, that we cover in my science teaching methods class where some students were studying uh, electricity, I believe it was at some sort of technical high school, and the teacher connected the wire they were going to be measuring to a 700 volt source. Again, 700 volts, much less than a Van de Graaff generator, but the important thing here is it was connected to a source that could su continually supply current to that wire, and some kid on a dare uh, from his friends touched the wire. He did so with the palm of his hand, and what that causes your palm to do is your, your whole palm contracts, and so you actually grab onto the wire and are unable to let go, and by the time the instructor could uh, shut off the power supply, the kid had unfortunately uh, died. So the thing we actually look at in class is the briefing from the court case where the parents are suing the school district. Um, the current's ability to pass through your body, though, of course, depends on the resistance of your body, and that varies widely. And there's some discussion in a middle section of chapter 26 here at night, which talks about uh, the body's resistance varying. And so it's fairly impossible to say, oh, my resistance is 100 ohms and therefore this is the maximum amount of current that I'll get. It varies widely. It depends on the type of body tissue that you're talking about. It depends on whether a person's sweaty or not. All kinds of factors go into that. Finally, uh, as we saw in the previous slide, there are features in our everyday electrical lives that are meant to keep us safe. The ground part of the electrical plug matters. The polarizing feature of a plug where you have one slot that's higher than the other also matters for the way things are wired. And so those devices make the electrical circuits in our house safer than they would be without them. So if at all possible, you should not try to bypass any of those features of a plug when you're using the electrical system in your house. All right, with that grisly picture to haunt your nightscapes, uh, this concludes the lecture on uh, capacitance and inductance in AC circuits, as well as some topics related to electrical energy transmission.